Thanks for joining us, everybody. My name is Steve Slavik. I'm a librarian here at the Addison Public Library. And tonight we're gonna to be looking at the question, can you trust the mainstream media? So tonight we're gonna to be discussing a few objectives that we have for this program. The first one is whether, or I should say, to identify the American public's trust and or opinion of the mainstream media. We're gonna be looking at and examining why Americans believe or disbelieve the mainstream media. We're gonna discover how and why the mainstream media delivered the news. And then finally, we're gonna determine if you can trust them. So let's get started. This is a, 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 a diagram here that came out, I guess they were looking at information from 1983. The number of corporations that uh, own me, the media, I guess you can say it. Go back, let me go back here for a quick second. So number of corporations that own the US media. When again, we're looking at newspapers, books, everything that you read, hear, or see. And in 1983, there were 50 major corporations that owned the media. As you can see, over the last 40 years, this number has gone down. Um, I can't exactly say why, except perhaps that some of these corporations had more money and they wanted more power and they were able to, to basically buy these other corporations. It says here that in 2000, it was six, that we're gonna actually see on the next screen that it's actually five now. So, well, actually still six. So it's basically telling us there are all these newspapers I shouldn't talk, I should just keep my hand away from the pointer. <laughs> Let's go back here. All of these newspapers, all of these magazines, radio stations, et cetera, that are owned by six corporations, at least in the year 2000. And like I said, now in 2020, it's, it's five corporations. But that equals out to 90% of what we adults here and teens, um, all of that stuff is controlled by five corporations. I'd like you to think about that while we continue in this program. Here's a great quote from uh, Malcolm X, who was a civil rights leader in the 60s. The media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent, and that's power, because they control the minds of the masses. And we're gonna be looking at power and looking at controlling the masses in this program as well. So I wanted to um, begin by saying that this program is neither you know, left-leaning or right-leaning. I'm trying to be very um, in the middle, I guess you can say. And one of the reasons I put these two images up here is to say that you know, media and controlling us basically by what we hear, read, and see is not something new. It's not something that just came out since Trump was president, was named president four years ago. This is something that was also in play during Obama's you know, years, as well as many years before that. So as you can see, an image here of this little reporter on Obama's little pinky finger. And over on the right, of course, we have um, a couple corporations that Trump and Putin are taking for a walk while I'm guessing they have a bunch of money in those bags there. So again, it's not one or the other, it's both. And that's just kind of the world we live in, at least here in the US. So looking at bias in the media, I have a, I tried to make these, as, these words as lar large as I can. So people who might be having trouble with vision and so forth can kind of see this. That's not really reflected here simply because you really can't do that with at least this line here. So what I'm, what I'm talking about is the far left is more is majorly, I guess you can say liberal, followed by less liberal and then center. So when we're looking at bias in the media, we're looking at some of these corporations who are you know, on that, on that gauge and also on leaning toward conservative or totally far right. And these outlet reports, uh, news, th these guys report the news according to a specific agenda or through a political lens. I can't say all of them do, because we're gonna look into exactly what all this might mean, but a, a large chunk of them, from my research at least, has shown that to be true. 
So here's a quote by uh, Gore Vidal. When you control opinion, as corporate America controls opinion in the US by owning the media, you can make the masses believe almost anything you want and guide them as you please. So this is a little bit further than what Malcolm X was saying, which was, if you control the minds of the people, well, you have pretty much ultimate control. Here, Gore Vidal is going a little bit further in saying, well, what's the point of you know, having that control unless you guide them and tell them what they should think and do? actually go beyond thinking, but actually carrying that out and doing something about it. So um, the ways the mainstream media delivers the news, and it really is something how, when we consume news, whether again, if it's watching TV, it's listening to the radio, whether if it's reading reports online or if it's on magazines, newspapers, all of that influences how we see the world. It's through our own political spectrum. And that's really what this is focusing on today in this program is politics, because that's what a lot of the information we get. If it's not through our um, local news stations or local newspapers and that sort of thing, it's more national. So we have to find out, are their interests aligned with the American public? I'd say yes. <laughs> and we'll be looking at that again. But here's the thing, when those interests are aligned with the American public, we're looking at two different parties, right? We're looking at the left and the right. And in this instance, most of the, as I said, most of these corporations are gonna be affiliated with one side or the other. But as this next paragraph says, independence ensures we get unbiased information to make informed opinions. It's meaningless if the media isn't free from outside influence. Otherwise, others have the freedom to control what we think and do. Now, if you look back, going back to the American Revolution, the framers, this was something huge on their list. They didn't want to have, they couldn't even comprehend the idea of a, of a corporation of thousands, much less tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands working for them. They were thinking local journalists, and those people were just putting out, you know, out numerous newspapers all across the 13 colonies. This was something that they found very important that there not be outside influence into their world of journalism at that time. As you can see, things have totally changed over the last few hundred years. So why aren't we hearing about this? Why aren't we hearing that mainstream media might not be as reliable as we would hope them to be? Well, of course, the people who work for those corporations, the journalists, the ones who are out there putting those news stories together, they're the ones who are paid by these corporations. So therefore they don't, probably don't, I can't say that they don't, they may not have total freedom in what they report and how they report. So um, one of the reasons this is an issue is a lot of the information that we get is important. Yeah, no doubt, totally. But a lot of dull information, boring information is avoided because who, who really cares, right? It's just not gonna sell newspapers. It's not gonna you know, win airtime on TV. Overly complex stories are often ignored as well. After all, would you wanna read a two page newspaper article and get to the end, if it's confusing, you might have to read the whole thing again. They want these reporters and journalists, they want to be able to hit you straight and try to make it very clear and concise. Okay, so there might also be a conflict with the organizational interests of, well, the corporation for the news, the news corporation. Um, in addition to that, there might be an advertiser conflict of interest. That's something that many people don't really think about. I mean, these advertisers, you know, Procter and Gamble, I don't know, Colgate, whatever, they're putting their information, their uh, advertisements on Fox or CNN. They're doing it because their demographics told them that they may benefit from having, you know, putting on these these news organizations or in newspapers or on the radio, whatever. So if it doesn't, if it conflicts with the advertisers, well. The journalists may not be willing to put that information in there because you know they may lose influence. 
Now I did have a, a question here. I'm gonna to try to get to that. Um, will, oh, will I be able to share my PowerPoint? Uh, you teach sociology in different community colleges, okay. And the information so far is fantastic, thank you. It'll be helpful for me to see it on my own. Okay, great. Um, yes, to answer you, thank you for your question. Yes, I'm gonna be hopefully having this information available in the next few days, I'm hoping by the end of the weekend. So if not, you feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I'll give you my, my contact information at the end of this program. All right, so what objectives does the media have? I'll get to your questions in just uh, the next slide. Well, it's to further their pursuits. They have objectives just like anybody else does in life. Everybody wants something and they're all doing it for a purpose. Well, in this instance, in some instances, I should say, unrivaled legitimacy rules the roost in this one. And we'll be getting a little bit more into that as we go on as well. More eyeballs or earballs or, well, one of those two um, equates to higher profits because people are listening to these radio shows. They're, they're, they're online looking at websites and they're, you know, looking at information that has advertisements on those websites. And that's how these media corporations make money from advertisements that are on their websites, that are on their radio, that are on their TV and in their newspapers. So the more people who are watching or consuming those news reports, the more those advertisers have to pay for that media time. And that domination makes us question information from other sources. Hmm. So if we're not getting the same news from every media outlet, then the news must be fake. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang on to this for just a moment. When we talk about domination in media, we're looking at you know, a certain corporation that may have a, a lot of pull, a lot of sway on the American public. Now, again, since we're talking about this in the political realm, if we're not, if we're not all getting information from the same place, well, we might be getting information that's different from one another. So let's take CNN, for example. They're a liberal um, media source for mainstream media. They, of course, a lot of people who prefer, you know, to hear about what their perspective is from CNN, probably because it's very similar to their own, want to hear what CNN says. In a lot of instances, CNN is saying negative things about Republicans or whatever to do with Republicans, conservatives, whatever. Well, now we can take a look at over at Fox News, same thing. It's just the opposite. You know, a lot of conservatives want and trust Fox News and the media and the information that they put out there. And a lot of that information is, you know, opposite from liberals. So when you look at that, we're talking about two different spectrums. One is looking, the liberals are looking at CNN, we'll say, they're getting a certain amount of information. On the other side, Republicans, the conservative side, is getting other information. Now, some of that information, you know, coincides. You know, you'll find some of the same information in both. But how they report that information will differ. The language that they use will differ. Some of the stuff that they decide to put in or take out is also going to be different. So when you have two different sides getting two different pieces of information, what does that tell you? If you have a friend that is, has a different personal political affiliation than you, and they're looking at this information from the other side, they're thinking you're nuts. <laughs> I mean, let, let's be honest. It's not the same of information that they're getting. So they're like, what is wrong with you? How can you not see what's right in front of your face and this guy on the left is doing the same thing to the folks on the right. That's why we have this, this situation with fake news. Some people say it's not fake news, other people do. It's very hard to meet in the middle when no one's getting their information from the same places and they're not getting the same exact information. So therefore, as it says down here at the bottom, the news must be fake. Now, journalists are trained to identify bias. That's just something they do when they go through you know, schooling and so forth. 
So how does that slip into the reporting? Well, there's a number of ways. The first one is not including a number of sources, multiple sources, to basically put their, um, their take on things, as well as opposing viewpoints. So multiple sources. Let's go with, say, for instance, there's a journalist out there, and he is speeding, speaking with, I don't know, a staff member from the White House who got information from one of his bosses, who got information from one of his bosses, who got it from you know, a high ranking official in the White House. So now we've, we've talked about three different levels of information being taken down and re, you know, reported to other people. Now in that time, information may shift, information may be taken out. Um, we now have multiple sources that this person all the way at the bottom, the staffer now has. And he might not be, you know, telling this journalist both sides of the story. He might only be, he might be leaving things out because he might not have gotten it from the one before him or the one before him or so, you know, on and on. Opposing viewpoints is also important. Here in the library field, back 20 years ago, we had a series of books called Opposing Viewpoints. This was generally for students in middle grade, uh, middle school and high school who would have assignments on many different aspects uh, you know, that affected our society at that time. It could be you know, uh, abortion or the death penalty or drugs or a whole host, everything that, you know, that is still a big deal now. During that time, we would have books in the library that we would get at pretty much every, li every public library where they would have one book dedicated to say the death penalty. They would have opposing viewpoints for it and against it. And that was something that, you know, students would would get, would want to get so they can, you know, get to their to do their report and so forth. Nowadays, we're not getting that because again, as I've mentioned, corporations have different agendas. And some of those parts of their agenda may be to not include certain information. We also have to look for, as I say here, the fact tellers. How much facts are in those news reports? Um, sometimes you'll find in fake news that you'll find facts, a lot of facts, but here and there you'll find fake news. You don't know it's fake news because you're, you've already seen a number of facts and you're like, all right, well, I trust this guy because I know this to be true. Everybody's reported on it. And then again, they slip in these other things that you, you just go along with. So these journalists, it's their job to report those facts, not to discuss how they feel about them. Hold on to that thought. So here is a, some, a, a poll that was put out by the Pew Research Center years, uh, not years ago, I think within the last year, and this is bias scores according to US adults and how much they trust the mainstream media. The blue down here at the bottom is showing these to be unbiased and these here in the pink to be biased. So let's look at these. The top three, PBS News, Associated Press, and National Public Radio are all not-for-profit organizations. They make their money, they get their funding from the government institutions, educational institutions like colleges and universities, that sort of thing, as well as just from donations by the general public. The Associated Press, same thing. National Public Radio, you get the message. So we're looking here at PBS News. It looks like Americans trust these guys the most. A little bit less Associated Press and on down. In my research and from what I've seen, I find that to be true. Um, you may disagree with me, that's fine. Everybody has their own opinion, but I watch here in the Midwest, uh, PBS News at 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. and it has a lot of factual information and it is boring. I will tell you, you're not gonna find any sensationalism there. The reporters are good. They're, um, if you're into politics and what's going on you know, in society, you'll be interested. But it's not, it's not something where emotions are going to get rattled or frazzled. It's not something where it's like, hey, check this out right now. No, they're very 
calm. Um, they're very, kind of monotone, not like, you know, some of what I'm doing right now, but it's just kind of reported talking like this. And can you tell us a little bit more about, <laughs> about that? Like I said, pretty boring. Associated Press and NPR, I could see why they'd be a little bit less. Um, do I still trust them? Yeah, I do. But apparently, you know, um, other Americans, their opinion of their unbiasedness is a little bit less. Wall Street Journal, um, USA Today, CBS News, ABC, I can see all of them um, being a little less forthright with some of the information that they might be reporting. Not necessarily is it always that way. Um, I would also say more likely some of that information may be slanted in one way or another based on you know, what they want to, of course, present in the news. So they, they may not uh, report on certain, a certain segment of you know, political side or what have you. Whereas I think they, they do, at least in PBS, at least again, from what I've seen. Uh, I've seen you know, um, ABC and CBS report one thing and then PBS showing that, but also explaining other things that led up to that event that totally, totally changes the, you know, a perspective on the viewer. So down here at the bottom, Washington Post, NBC News, going on downward, both liberal are, and conservative are represented there. Um, and again, in those instances, you know, MSNBC, you've got, it's a, it's a liberal um, corporation who's working on the news there and they'll be more opinionated. And Fox News, they'll be just as opinionated or more so. I've even seen on Fox News them calling, you know, a politician stupid, which I thought was really kind of, I don't know, inappropriate. Has MSNBC done it? Probably. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. I've watched MSNBC. I've never really called them, I've never really heard them call someone stupid. That's not to say that it hasn't happened, but I have had them, you know, scratch their head and make you think that, you know, the, uh, the Republicans or conservatives were stupid. So the liberals, in my opinion, from what I've seen, a lot of that is condescending, to be honest with you. They condescend toward the conservatives, whereas the, con the conservatives, were, they tend to be, they tend to lash out more. Um, again, just from my perspective, you know, I try to, to look at news outlets that, you know, report fact-based rather than you know, sensationalist or, you know, that exaggerate and that sort of thing. So now looking at a, a chart here talking about the coronavirus and the percentage that of Americans who say um, that, you know, it's a bigger deal than what it really is. So up here on the top here, we see Republicans or those who lean Republican at the start of the coronavirus where lockdowns just got put into place a couple weeks after that, 47% thought it was you know, a big deal. But then three months later, April, May, June, yeah, three months later, a, a larger percentage, another 15% thought that you know, the news, mainstream news was taking it way out of you know, the realm of importance or you know, it's, not, it's just not that big a deal. Whereas the Democrats, as you see, 14% in April, of 2020. And then three months later, only 4% more thought that we were making a bigger deal out of it is in the mainstream media than in reality. So what's the discrepancy all about? Why is, you know, why are more Republicans saying, you know, it's exaggerated, whereas Democrats are saying, no, not really. It's really kind of dangerous and we should be taking really good precautions. Part of it is the, you know, we have a, Republic, a Republican in office right now. Donald Trump has been telling people, you know, it's not that big a deal. It's, you know, no worse than the flu. He said that numerous times. Um, you know, he's made fun of Biden, Joe Biden, for wearing a mask larger, the largest mask in America, I think I heard him say. So, you know, he he's basically saying it's not something to be concerned about. And that makes sense when you look at the number of Republicans or leaning Republicans who you know, follow him and follow Fox News or other 
you know, conservative websites and, you know, te television, news programs, etc. And the totally opposite would be for Democrats. Democrats don't trust Trump. Obviously, um, Trump is saying it's not a big deal, but as we've seen, there's been a, a second wave of coronavirus infections in this country over the past few weeks. Um, here we're talking what, in mid-October of 2020. So, you know, they're just, there's just disbelief on their, on their part, whereas it's the same for the conservatives on the other. So again, looking pretty much at that, that same time period, we're finding people were interested, you know, once the lockdowns went into place, I think it was like right around March 15th of 2020, 57% of people were fo following this news closely. But three months later, almost 20% fewer people actually were paying attention. I think that has a lot to do with the conflict of opinion, of perspective from both parties, and therefore from both sides of the media spectrum. Both were getting totally different information. One was saying it's not, not that important, it's just as bad as the flu, you're making, you know, blowing things out of proportion. The other one was saying, you know, you're totally wrong. And because of that, two, the two sides can't meet a middle ground. And therefore they're thinking, well, I don't know who to trust. Again, two different sides reporting two different things. We don't know who to trust. And that I think is why you're getting less interest in the coronavirus. So it doesn't surprise me that, you know, four months later, cases are back on the rise, even though the physicians, the medical professional, community basically said that we would have a second wave come the fall. And here we are, and that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, so there you go. Many Americans are seeing more partisan viewpoints and struggling to know what is true. If you don't know what's true, why should you pay attention, right? So what is wrong with the news? Well, we've talked about corporations. They, there's five of them now that own the news basically in our ears, our, our eyeballs and you know, and everything. Um, they do it for profit. They can censor the news based on what they think and what they feel. And again, I mentioned advertisers and I've also mentioned, mentioned sensationalism, dumbing things down so people can get quick bites of information and not have to think too much. There's not as much critical thinking. Why? Because these media outlets will tell you what to think. Here's a, an image that I think is both interesting and curious. So here's a picture of Bernie Sanders. And he says, we cannot live in a vibrant democracy unless people get divergent sources of information. This goes back to what the framers of the constitution were saying 250 years ago. Um, Free, a free press, basically, is what they were talking about and always talking about. After all, at that time, we were getting information from the king of England who ruled over America at that time. Hence why we fought for our independence. Bernie Sanders is saying the same thing. What I think is interesting about this photo is Bernie seems like he's having a great time right there. And he has some guy in a headlock who really seems to enjoy getting put into a headlock by Bernie Sanders. So. I'm wondering, and I can't be certain, but I'm wondering if this image is fake, you know, that maybe Bernie had his, his elbow on a desk or something, on a, or on somebody's shoulder, I don't know. And then they, somebody just put this guy's head in there. I don't know. It, I think it's a curious photo and I just wanted to share it. So we're coming up on the election season. We're about two weeks away from the 2020 US presidential election. And there's been a lot of talk in the media about voter fraud. Is it real or fake? So here's a graph of all of the states in our union that are able or not able to vote by mail. So a reason is needed in this green section out here in the South to vote by mail. Granted, I don't know why they have to vote by mail. I didn't look into it. In the middle of the country and then in the North, you see that there's no reason needed to vote by mail. You just, you know, get something in the mail and it says, do you want to do this? And you reply back or go online and say, yes, I want to vote by mail. And then they send you something, you know, a ballot in the mail. 
This other one here in the purple, violet, all postal voting, mostly in the West. I don't know why it's it's mostly. There's a couple here in the on the East Coast, mostly here though in the West, and it looks like Hawaii does that. I'm not sure why, but I just thought I'd I'd share that with you. So, is there evidence of widespread fraud? Trump has said you get thousands and thousands of people sitting in somebody's living room signing ballots all over the place because he doesn't believe in voting by mail. It's it's fraudulent. Critics say, critics say, however, that people could vote more than once via absentee ballots and in person. I guess they're still saying, you know, going along with Trump, what Trump is saying. So I misread that at first. But numerous nationwide and state level studies over the years have not revealed evidence of major widespread fraud. And we're going to be showing that here in just a second. Individual U.S. states control their own voting rules for federal elections. And many are looking to increase postal voting to prevent large gatherings at polling stations on election day. So what's interesting here is that the rate of voting fraud overall in the US is minuscule, according to this 2017 study. So 0. 0.00004 of all of the ballots that went through the mail were fraudulent. What does that mean? We'll be getting to that in a second, because right here it shows that there are provisions in place to prevent people from impersonating others or from stealing ballots. And in addition, a lot of these, uh, I should say, for the most part, I think everyone will check your, your signature on your ballot according to when you first signed up to vote. And I, I know I did at the DMV here in Illinois. So I had had to sign my name and they would take a look at my ballot and my, you know, um, the application that I had from the DMV to get my license and match them up. They would also take a look at the registered address on, you know, and make sure that that person actually lived at that address. It's a lot of work. So President Trump has claimed that the signature for mail-in vo um, voting doesn't have to be verified. But as I said, this is generally how it's done to prevent people from impersonating others or stealing ballots. Most states do specifically, like I said, compare signatures and what they have on file. This is from the British Broadcasting Corporation, who I think is up there with the AP and NPR um, from September, so a month ago, basically. So there have been suggestions that an increase in postal voting, um, by po postal voting by mail, is going to have a bigger turnout for Democrats than Republicans. But as of now, there's no strong evidence that shows there's that advantage. This individual here, Amber McReynolds, um, basically, let's see put the numbers in context in an op-ed saying, let's put vote by mail fraud myth to the test. So what they did was they looked over the past 20 years and over 250 million ballots that were cast by mail throughout this country and found that of those 250 million, 143 criminal convictions for election fraud took place. And that's where we came in with that 0. 0.0004 to 0, 0, 0, 0.9, and this comes out to, you know, in the middle. Now, I do have to point out that 143 criminal convictions means they were convicted by law. Where there are more, it's possible. Um, but really, when you're looking at 0. 0.0000s, 000, 000, I mean, take, take a, a one or two zeros away, and you're still looking at, you know, like a tenth of a percentage point. It's just so insignificant that it's kind of ridiculous. So we recently had, I think it was last week, we recently had the vice presidential debates on TV. And the following day, what I did was I went over and took a screenshot of two different websites. And I'm gonna show those to you right now. 
The first one is CNN, and I've tried to blow it up screen-wise so you guys can see this. It might still be a little bit difficult for that. I'm, I apologize, but I wanted to try to get everything on here as much as possible. So CNN leans liberal or is liberal, and what you're seeing here goes along with, you know, how they view th their, you know, their worldwide perspective on politics. They're showing Trump calls in for an ugly hour-long ramble. Again, they're not saying that he called into a radio or a TV show, I think it was Fox News, and, you know, talked to the journalist at the, the anchors at the desk. No, they're saying he called in for an ugly hour-long ramble. So they're saying it's ugly and it's a ramble. You know, like he doesn't know what he's talking about. So yeah, there's some bias there. They're also showing him taking his mask off because again, that's something they find, you know, very important. Here we go with um, in the middle, Trump denigrates Kamala Harris after she beat down stereotypes. So they're basically saying, Trump is saying bad things about her after Harris, you know, refuted stereotypes. She's in the right, Trump is in the wrong because he's denigrating her. He's, he's making fun of her or he's putting her down in one way or another. So if you look at some of these here um, on this page, you're getting a lot of negativity for, you know, for or against the conservatives and a lot of, you know, pro-liberal type leanings. Next one is Fox News. And you'll find pretty much the same thing, but just from the other side. Here we have a picture of Biden with his mask on, of course, and it says virtual insanity. That's sensationalism, making something way more, you know, crazy because let's let's take a like Biden lashes out at Trump after tr uh, president says he won't participate in a virtual debate. So, he won't debate him, you know, virtually. So now Biden is lashing out at him and it's virtual insanity. Let's take a look at uh, this picture of Kamala Harris here. Um, the undecided voters consider her abrasive and condescending. That might be true. Everyone's perspective is different, but let's look at her face. You know, everything that the media does, they do for a reason. They put things in their own lens and they do that to make you, as we talked about, to make you feel feel something, to make you think something, and to eventually make you do something. Let's also take a look at um, AOC, the representative from New York, who's also a Democrat. So she lashes out, again, um, for using her nickname, alleges gross behavior. And what is she? She doesn't look too happy there, folks. So, you know, it's putting the other side in, an, in a position opposed, you know, opposite to Republicans, basically. And they're giving their base, what they're interested in. So is, neither, is either side right? I don't know. You'd have to have you know, watched the debates and you know, gotten this information and looked at that stuff for yourself you know, and come up with your own conclusions. So I'm gonna give you an example of facts versus a real article. And it is going to be about uh, when the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris burned down about a year or so ago. So here we have the facts. It happened on April 19th, the roof of the cathedral and the spire collapsed. No one was injured. French officials said the fire probably started because of a short circuit. Straight facts. Now let's go to a news article. I'm gonna let you guys read that for a minute. So as you can see, there's a lot more information there. Or is there? That's for, you know, there's a lot more words, right? There's a lot more emotion in what's been told. This happened April 19th. Let's go to the next page and get some more information on it. Why was there such a difference? Why is the difference important from just facts to a story? The first paragraph was boring. That's the PBS version, at least in my interpretation. The second described event, it told us about the environment. There was flames, you know, smoke coming out, and it affected how 
you know, they showed how it affected the people who were there watching it. You know, some were crying perhaps. By embellishing the story, it got more interesting because now you're seeing things through the people, the people's eyes, basically. It basically told you how to feel. So I have a question here, let's see. Um, second, yeah, exactly. The second paragraph was more sensationalized. It was more like a story than a report, exactly. And that's, and that's what we're getting at here. The first was PBS version, just the facts. The second one was they're making it a story. Why is that important? Because as humans, from the beginning of time, at least from the beginning of talking or even hieroglyphics and caves, people tell stories, whether if it's about their tribe, if it's about their family, we tell stories. That's how we relate to the world and each other. And this is something by embellishing the story, by giving you more information by what the reporters saw, it fills in a lot of that information. It, it you know, stimulates our imagination and makes us feel like we're there and makes us feel something, not only about the people, but about the event as well. So there you go. By doing that, it allows for bias to creep in. Now, who knows, maybe those people weren't crying. Maybe they, there wasn't smoke you know, going on at that time. Maybe that's just something the journalist did to try to get more people to read that article. I don't know, I wasn't there in Paris that day, so I can't really tell you. It's possible, but again, by embellishing a story, and I have to keep using that word, by adding more you know, to it, it allows us to feel more. And therefore, it, it becomes more real, at least in our minds. So uh, let's take a look at American trust in the mass media. This is a chart from that goes back from 1998 um, and even before then, because it says here from this Gallup poll, it does, from 1972, 74, and 76, not shown. So really, it's it's probably you know from years after that, all the way through to 2020. So Americans' trust, as you can see, has gone down pretty much every year, except for one or you know a few instances, and it really hit a low in 2016, where only 32 percent of trust was placed in the media. 2016, as you may remember, was when we had a presidential election between two people and two types of, you know, bases, at least for at least, I don't know, most recent media where Trump was talking about fake news and his base. Yeah, fake news is all the rage. It's not fake. I mean, how can I how can I replay that? Everything is fake. It's it's not fake that he's saying it's fake. It's real. And, you know, Democrats, the other side might be saying the opposite, but we're still talking half of the population voting one way, half of the other reporting this or, you know, feeling a different way. Of course, you could see why such a low was hit in that election year. And now, I mean, you know, it went up a bit. Now it's going back down, probably because the coronavirus this year and also because the election and because of mail in votes. And is it fraudulent? You know, is it going to upend the election? Is it going to make it, you know, unworthy of even having an election because it's all fake? I guess we'll find out. So here's American trust in mass media by political party. So again, in the previous slide, I showed you just baseline percentage. Now we're breaking it down again by political party. So as you can see, for Democrats, it looks like their trust has been either kind of equal, maybe go down a little bit, but for the most part, it's going up. And when is it going up? In 2016. Why? Because so much of you know, the media is liberal. So that's why you're getting a jump from 51% onward and up even higher, because these, these liberal media outlets are reporting things that they like to hear, which is that Trump is a fraud or he's a liar or that, you know, he cheats on his taxes, whatever you want to come up with. And the total opposite is taking place with the Republicans. They're, they're not having much, you know, trust in, in the mass media at all. Again, mostly during Trump's presidency because he's constantly bombarding everyone that the media is fake. You can't trust him. 
So that's why you get this huge divergence. And that's why it's such a big deal in these years right here. So really, why, and I kind of alluded to this already, why do Democrats trust the mainstream media, but Repub Republicans do not? Well, there's more reasons than just fake or not fake news. Republicans feel underrepresented. Why? Where are the, think about this, where are the mainstream media located? In a lot of instances, it's New York, it's Chicago, and, or Illinois, Chicago, we'll say New York City, Chicago, and we'll say LA. But there's also other big places, big uh, cities in, in California as well, like San Diego, San Francisco. Um, CNN is based out of Atlanta, which on all counts is a conservative state. Sometimes that flips, but mostly in most instances, it's, it's been conservative. So that might be an outlier, but for the most part, you know, that's kind of where all the mainstream head to the major cities. So many of the people who support the government of the people, the GOP, the, the Republicans are wealthy. Something relatively, relatively few others can identify with. When I say that, when I say wealthy, I'm talking about, you know, making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, I can't, I, I can't, I can't, me personally, I can't identify with that. I don't know what that feels like. I don't have a, you know, a vacation home or two homes or three. I don't go on vac vacation four times a year. You know, I'm a librarian, you know. Um, that's just out of my realm of even thinking possible right now, at least in my life, you know, unless I win the lottery or something like that. So these folks believe left-leaning media doesn't critically assess Democratic presidents. All right, so they're saying that during Obama's eight years, the liberal media, CNN, MSNBC, they didn't really criticize Obama at all. Why? Because he was, you know, telling it like from their, their side of things. And while Republican presidents get all the necessary, you know, nasty treatment from the liberal media, from the Democratic side. So given this perspective, Republicans have been led to believe that media went beyond bias and then began actively just lying, straight out just lying. So they may have a bias, but they're also now lying on top of it. That they're now the enemy because they're lying and that they have taken up this charge, not only to tell people about it, but they've weaponized mainstream media to gain support from their base. And what I mean by that is they're telling lies. Don't you trust those, you know, liberal media, mainstream media? It's not just, and I have to point that out. It's not just liberal media. The Republicans don't like a lot of Republicans don't like, they dislike mainstream media. Some of them dislike Fox news because they say even they lie. So those who, you know, are po opposed to mainstream media, like I said, have weaponized it as something to rally their base. To, to rally around and say, you know, this is really important. We can't let this slide. The media is telling lies. You know, we have to call them out every single time and you can't trust them. Don't, don't listen to them. So finally, this is a chart right here that I found that I can't make bigger. This is the best I can do. As you'll see here earlier in the program, I mentioned that on the left side of the screen, you had very liberal views, then leaning left or leaning uh, liberal democratic center-based views of people who, like I mentioned, PBS, NPR, Associated Press, um, they're center. They try to tell the facts and try not to have a bias. I'm not saying they don't have a bias. I'm just saying they try to stick to the facts basically, followed by you know leaning right, and you know, a very much a conservative news organization. So here we have in the middle, the Weather Channel, of course, right? Um, Associated Press, that's pretty much in the middle. Uh, let's see what else is in here. USA Today is close. I think that's the BBC, I can't really tell. Again, it's all, you know, mucked up. Off on the right a little bit that you can, you know, that has some bias, Wall Street Journal, New York Post, going down. Um, some of these I've never even heard of, like the Blaze. I don't know it. Uh, there's Fox News and, and another Fox News. 
And then on the left-hand side, you're going to get, you know, the opposite. Um, Huffington Post, I think it is, very liberal, and they post outlandish things. Um, and yeah, even if you, even if you are a liberal, liberal, you'll just look at them and go, oh my gosh, I don't know, they're out there. I'm surprised they're not further down, to be honest with you. CNN, yeah, they're they're off down there. Who else is in here? Um, that's really it, I think. All, a lot of these other ones I'm not really seeing, but it gives you an idea. The closer they are to the center, the closer they are to telling um, you know, just the facts. You'll also see these, these, these uh, rectangles here. And in the green, the green is saying that they're most reliable for news. So in this area, followed by reliable for news and high in analysis and opinion content. So all these guys here, They'll give you the news, but they'll give you their opinions and their viewpoints. So it's not necessarily unbiased. It's here's the news and here's what we think about it, or here's what, what you should be thinking about because that's what we're, what we're reporting. And then there's some other stuff on there too. So yeah, good luck guys. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a whole smattering of everything. It's difficult to find out you know, what sources are true. I've, in this program, I've, I've tried to point out from the mainstream media anyway, some of the ones that I feel I can trust doesn't mean everyone can trust, you know. I don't know, I, I leave that up to the individual. You know, we all have our own perspectives and our own uh, critical thinking hats. So keep that in mind going forward. And with that, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those guys right now. As, uh, as I mentioned, what I'll try to do is post this to our YouTube channel for the Addison Public Library here in Illinois. There's a number of Addison Public Libraries out there, so it's the one in Illinois. Um, I'll try to have that out in the next few days. If not, no later than next week, I'll do my darndest to make sure it happens. Let's see. So who do I trust? Thanks for your question. Uh, as I said, I, I trust PBS because they're so boring and they give a lot of content. You know, a lot of the information that you get on, you know, 5.30 news, at least here in the central time zone for ABC, NBC and CBS, they can only spend maybe a couple minutes on any given item. Whereas on PBS, they're going for a whole hour and they can, you know, they'll also decide what they wanna cover and what they don't wanna cover, but they may spend five to seven minutes on the fires raging in the West you know, and give you a whole lot of information. In addition to that, I've seen their anchor talk to both uh, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, who's a Democrat, as well as uh, Jared Kushner, who's, um, you know, a loyal person in Trump's sphere. Um, I've heard this person interview both of those indiv individuals, and I've seen her ask a lot of tough questions questions that neither side wanted to answer. And how do they not answer? They just they just veered off into a different direction and just didn't answer the question at all. So they will, in, in a lot of instances, ask the tough questions. All right, so uh, let's see what else we've got here. Um, let's see. What are some sources that are unbiased? Well, as I said, NPR is pretty good. I've listened to their radio in the morning. Um, and again, they will press both Republicans and Democrats. However, I do think they press Republicans a little harder than they do the Democrats. And that's just from, you know, my experience. Um, they will continue hammering away at, you know, continually asking the question, whereas they might ask a liberal that question once. And if they don't get an answer, they may not keep pushing or not. Uh, let's see, are all sources biased? That's a very good question. I'm, I'm of the opinion that it is incredibly difficult to be completely unbiased. So, you know, whatever source you're looking at, I think there's going to be some bias somewhere. Like I, like I mentioned in that, uh, those, those homepage screens from CNN and Fox News the day after the presidential, the vice presidential debate, you got words that were heightened. And they did that for a reason. So in any article, even one on the burning of the Notre Dame Cathedral, you're getting stuff in there that, 
you know, is the opinion of the reporter who's reporting, talking about people crying or weeping, I think it said. So maybe it happened. Maybe someone was itching their eye. We don't know. We don't know. So uh, the next question, when did corporations start buying other corporations? I'd probably say, gosh, over 100 years ago. I'm not really sure when when corporations really started getting incorporated, meaning they became a corporation and they earned that, you know, uh, credits from taxation and so forth, meaning they can, you know, write things off in their taxes. I'd imagine that that has been going on for, I don't know, since the Civil War, maybe even before that, maybe, because I mean, there's certain publications like the Chicago Tribune, a newspaper here in Chicago that's been around since before the, um, the Great Chicago Fire, which happened in 1871. So that was a major corporation at that time. So it's been, it's been going on for a long time. But as you saw in the beginning of this presentation, there were 50 major ones in 1983. And then over the past 20 years, that's gone down to five. Will I, can I imagine that it goes down to four or three? I think that might be pretty tough. And I think the reason being is because even today, there was a report that the um, Justice Department is filing an antitrust law against Google, the search engine, because they, ain't, they own too much of the search market. Uh, most, more people than anybody go to Google to search st for stuff online. And they're saying basically that it is a monopoly. So really, if you have, mo if you have less than five corporations who own so much of the, the mainstream media, there's going to be some of that too. Like, when does a monopoly begin and end? That is something that, you know, our legislature has to determine and probably will if one of those corporations tried to buy up the other. So how does all this relate <laughs> to the 1996 Telecommunications Act? In all honesty, I have no idea. I don't remember. I don't know really. I think I I've heard of it, but I don't know anything about it. I haven't done any research on it. So that's your homework for tonight to find out how that might relate to the Telecommunications Act. Sorry, I couldn't give you a better answer than that. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, anybody else have any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Like I said, I, I really enjoyed this. Um, I spent, ever since I did our, our fake news presentation last month, I was actually putting some of this information into that presentation, and I just found that it would, that presentation would have been too massive. So I had to narrow it down, and I just basically created a whole other presentation because it was, there's so much interest in it, I think, at least from my, my perspective. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hopefully you can share it with some students, and they might get a different opinion of you know, what's out there and who's sharing what and why. So thank you very much. I hope you have a, a good rest of your evening. Take care, everybody.